several centuries ago when uh, Père Jean de Brébeuf decided to explain the, the story of the nativity to the Huron people that he was working among, he looked at them and he knew that he would not be able to tell the story that he was raised with. There wouldn't be any inclusion of shepherds and sheep because the Huron culture didn't have those. They wouldn't have gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh because they were unknown. Angels were not part of the culture. Wise men were, wise people were, elders that were respected. So when he wrote what we now commonly call the, the Huron Christmas Carol or the Canadian Christmas Carol, he used the imagery that was known to the people in order for them to understand the story. A very basic principle, but not always one that was employed by those over the last 2,000 years who have d done mission work among various cultures that were not their own. The reason I'm mentioning it is because it's, that's the context, that's the, that's the intellectual muscle, really, that we have to bring to the reading today. This is known as Reign of Christ or Christ the King Sunday. Now, first of all, the reason we have this Sunday is not because we want to glorify God as King or Jesus as King. It was started actually during, um, in the early days of, of Nazi and um, Italian fascism, where the, uh, a priest wanted to highlight the fact that neither Hitler or Mussolini was Lord. Jesus was. Neither of them was king. Jesus was. And something far vaster than the simplicity of a national boundary or even the conquered territories that the Nazis had by this time. It wasn't an empire. What he was trying to emphasize was a political statement. Unfortunately, the meaning behind Reign of Christ or Christ the King Sunday has, has often been lost. And people treat it as glorifying God as a kingly figure, much like Jean Brebeuf encountered. When we use imagery that is familiar to us in one hand, some, it, it's shorthand, it, it helps people understand a concept, but what we risk is people taking that concept too far. So we have a, a subculture now, especially within Western Christianity, where we look at Jesus on a throne. We look at Jesus as a king figure. The scripture today kind of calls us up on that, calls us back to that. We have the story in, from John 18 where Pilate is challenging Jesus and acknowledges he's not a Hebrew person. He, he really could care less about some of the definitions, but says, are you king? Now, what Pilate's really asking uh, is, do we have to worry about a rebellion trying to overthrow the empire? The answer is not simple. I mean, Jesus could very have simply said, no, I don't know what they're going on about, and possibly walk away. But the reality was, even though he didn't want to claim the title king in an earthly sense, he was kind of trying to throw, overthrow the empire. Pilate had good reason to be concerned. The, the Pharisees and Sadducees definitely had reason to be concerned. But Jesus wasn't going to fall into their trap and give himself a title. We've done that in the centuries past, the millennia past. We've wanted to elevate because king is something we understand. In 2,000 years ago, king was all-powerful. Through the Middle Ages, kings were all-powerful. They decided life and death. They decided who had jobs, who didn't. They decided where the resources went. They decided if you starved, you starved. If they wanted to give something to someone else, they did. They had that power of life and death over everything. That was what the church wanted people to understand about God, that God had the power of life and death. But unfortunately, when you collate images that are earthly with images that are spiritual, the spiritual is harder to understand, so very often it becomes an earthly understanding. Now, over the centuries, the whole idea of king has morphed. No longer do we see king as all-powerful. We see king as sort of a figurehead, something that, that represents tradition and, and, and a, a very conservative, staid way of going about life. And we've incorporated that now in our understanding of what king would be. None of it is helpful. Now, we still have a Jesus who is very prepared to help overturn empires but it's how we go about it. 
those who are focused on the political power of a king are also scared of the military power of a coup and overthrowing the government of the day. I think that's one of the reasons why religious leaders have taken so many pains to change who Jesus is to all of us, to, to paint Jesus as a, as a judgment, as someone who is going to be unhappy with something, as someone who made claims that quite frankly he never did, rather than deal with the actual very real comments that Jesus made, the very real challenges to our society the very real threat, quite frankly, to the rich and the political powerful who want to keep what they have. They don't want to share. When we look at this Sunday reign of Christ, the whole concept of, you know, Jesus is king, therefore Hitler isn't, or therefore fill in the blank with any, any modern political leader you can think of, we have to start looking at what the words are underneath of that. If Jesus is king, and take for example Charles is not, then does Jesus have Charles' job? See the connection? We understand what it means to be the king of England. We, it's a concept we can grasp, it's tangible. Jesus is king, not so much. Not in the way it was presented. And that's Pilate is a, is a wonderful way of, for us to actually get a glimpse on that. Jesus said then, as we should hear now, who you say I am, who you think I am, that's not the point. That's not why I'm here. There's something bigger. There's something different. There's something outside the box. There's something more challenging. There's something more fundamentally threatening to your power than any military might or any challenge to succession ever could in a modern political understanding. Jesus as king, Jesus as the reign, Jesus as the one who has oversight. If we truly adhere to that, we are compelled to be co-workers in that. In fact, that's one of our, our primary commissions. So what does it look like to revision, to reimagine what authority looks like, what monarchy looks like, if we, if we want to use those languages. Do we even want to use that language? What is it that Jesus brought as a threat to the empire? We know now it wasn't that he wanted personal power. That, that wasn't the thing. It wasn't that he wanted the riches. That wasn't a thing either. How did he want to overturn things? How did he want to challenge things? How do we now today's world, when it seems like we are stuck right back 2,000 years ago with powerful leaders who have no care or concern about real people, who only want wealth for themselves and their friends, and winning is the only thing that matters. They don't see the office as something that matters in leadership, and, and that's cross nations. How do we, as Christians, stand up with that? Well, Jesus is the king, not modern politicians. Jesus is the sovereign. Jesus is the leader. Jesus is the, is the one who showed us the community. The thing is that Jesus never did do anything alone. And this is a very powerful reminder to all of us who feel maybe helpless in the, in the latest political struggles around the world, that Jesus asked for our help. And we have that power. So the thing with overturning the empire was not that Jesus was going to lead an army. It's that he was going to change hearts and minds. So people would want more. They'd want better. And they'd want better for their neighbor. They'd want better for their friends. They, they'd even want better for the people they don't get, get along with. That's how we bring about a world where we can honestly say earthly understanding of political leadership means nothing. It doesn't matter the terms you use. Just don't obsess about them. Don't, don't try to fit Jesus into such a narrow little box. Each of us has the ability to look at Jesus' words and say, that's, that might be who you say, but that's not who I know him to be. Follow his lead with Pilate and with so many others. 
change the world around you. Offer kindness. Give what you can. You know, even if it's a cup of coffee to a homeless person who's freezing, that is bringing the new community, the new kingdom that God has, has talked about. Loving our families. But more than that, supporting our families to be better people. It's, it's really easy to love the people we like. Not so easy to necessarily support them, especially when they do things differently than we'd like. Be there to help strangers. Don't think that your own little world is the only world that matters. When Jesus talked about changing the world, it was not just the area territory of the Hebrews. It wasn't just Judah. It wasn't even just the Roman Empire. It was everything. And Jesus' way of doing that was empowering us. So yeah, today we can mark Christ the King, and it's the, the end of the uh, liturgical year, and it's a, it's a wonderful send-off. We're on a high of, of social challenge to remind the political leaders of the world that they are not the last word, no matter what they might think of themselves. But that's not where we stop. That's where we start. We're going to be starting a new season next, next week. Another advent, another, uh, another waiting, another preparation for what is to come. All of our lives should be a lived advent. It should be a recognition that earthly stuff is not the point. But we have to use the resources we have to make it better so that the world that is envisioned can come about. Now is not the time to lie down or think someone else is going to come in and solve the problem. They're not. Now is the time for us to get up and get moving. And nothing should inspire us more than the call that came almost 100 years ago that said, don't let the fascists have the last word. They are not God. They are not king. They are not sovereign. That's Jesus. And following Jesus really will make the world a better place.